buffer's empty. The producer has a problem that the buffer's full. So one of the things we've done is we implemented a solution to that using a semaphore. Uh, semaphore basically says, hey, um, I want to go in there and freeze that critical region so that I can update it and then I'll let it go so then the other guy can go ahead and try and say, hey, I want to change it too, but you know, the producer's in the middle of changing things, I'm not going to overwrite its variables or whatever. Um, and then we all can also go ahead and have a additional uh, semaphore, not a binary semaphore, um, but a, a semaphore with a number, and that's going to give us our how many things are in the buffer, so you can go ahead and check for full energy coverage. <coughs> Any questions on the semaphores, the binary semaphores, mutual exclusion zones, etc.? Okay, and we'll proceed on. Again, uh, you can do this. Um, this was sort of the, the theoretical, hey, how would we do it? They talked about the uh, mutex and then explicitly said, hey, in, uh, in a POSIX uh, thread library, what are the exact calls you would be making? And then, so let's redo that with those exact calls. So not a lot of extra done there. All right. <clears throat> so semaphores and mutexes can be used to implement this kind of solution, right? But if you ever mess up, okay, and you, you know, do that down or, or up when you shouldn't have, then the whole thing goes awry. So it would be nice if there was something that did all that work for you, right? Uh, let's go ahead and put that work someplace else. Something work, has worked on it, they tested it, they know it works, and you can just make the call and you're done. So a lot of times they will go ahead and um, put that code literally in the compiler, okay? And so you can have uh, compiler-driven procedures to produce uh, that mutual ex exclusion, okay? So now only one process can make a call at a time, everything else is blocked, um, use these condition variables that allow things to be blocked. Um, they're not necessarily counters, um, they're more conditions. You can still have a problem if you, um, are, you know, don't implement the property and lose those signals, but in any case, there's simply an idea of I'm going to encapsulate all that code. Everybody's had data structures, right? Okay, so I can go ahead and take that code, I'm going to encapsulate it um, into an object, and that object's the monitor. And the monitor takes care of all the semaphores and mutexes. All right. So a simple monitor might be, hey, you've got your, your condition variable, you've got your producer, you've got con your consumer, and the code in the producer is gonna go ahead and check that condition, that semaphore. Um, the code in the consumer is gonna check its semaphore, you check your exclusive regions, they all know about that. Inside the monitor, but then outside the monitor, you just call producer and consumer. So, um, here they've got the actual full code, and I will send this to you if it's not the book. Um, so in any case, you've got your monitor up here. It's the one doing all the um, if counts in and wait full, or if counts negative one and signal empty. And then down here, all you do is you just say, hey, um, uh, producer, give me an item. Or consumer, remove an item. Okay. So then the code down here is super easy. All of that has been incorporated into the monitor. Okay, well, semaphores are sort of low level. I mean, you're doing all the work and you have to make sure that you did it correctly for if things go bad. Uh, monitors, um, one compiler may implement it different from another compiler, so it's not necessarily reliable across multiple languages. So, Maybe there's another way to do it, and that's uh, another option is called message passing. So you pretty much have two primitive calls, send and receive, okay? And these are system calls. So you'll go ahead and do a send to somebody, a message, and then um, you can have a receive. And again, you have this somebody, this pie for this, this shared thing, uh, and you can get a message. Well, <coughs> um, you're gonna end up waiting 
until you receive the message. So you're basically in a block state. So you go down and you say, hey, I want to you know, consume something. You say, hey, I'm going to receive this message. As soon as they send the message, then you're good to go. But until then, you're going to be in that blocked uh, block state. So um, again, with message passing, you can have problems across uh, the network. If the network packet dies, you lose a message, then you may be waiting indefinitely. Um, so you're waiting for an acknowledgement that doesn't even deliver. Now, we finally get to the Byzantine generals problem that we heard about earlier, right? So you've got the five generals. Uh, if all five of them attack, then they can overwhelm the city because they have more than the city defenders. But if anybody doesn't get the message, then when they try to attack, they will be outnumbered and will lose. So how do we go ahead and decide um, how can we fix this problem? Well, we're gonna send up a message and say, hey, I'm about to attack. And if everybody sends back, yes, we, we heard you. Yes, we will attack. You know, and do that acknowledgement, then we're good to go. But of course, if the guy doesn't see the acknowledgements, then he won't attack. Then he, so he has to acknowledge the acknowledgement and then they have to acknowledge that they acknowledge it. You know, so it's that whole, how many times do you have to uh, uh, send that acknowledgement and tell everybody knows that we're good? And this is the same kind of thing here. If you send a message and it gets lost, then you may be in waiting forever. So how can you go ahead and um, uh, solve the problem where you've got multiple things sending messages which may get lost um, and so they have that same Byzantine generals uh, send the message, receive the acknowledgement, send the, the fact that you have the acknowledgement, or have a setting where, okay, as long as X many people have seen the message, then we're okay. Okay, <clears throat> but of course, when you're sending that message, you gotta copy the whole message, you gotta send the message, they gotta hit it and reply back which is great when you're on multiple machines across the network. If you're talking about two threads, sending, sending that message up, sending the message, receiving the message, copying it down, it's a lot of extra overhead. So um, doing that whole message passing is a lot slower than just using a simple cell phone. So oftentimes, if you're in a single thread, I mean, if you're in a single process, two threads talking to each other, you're not gonna go through all the um, overhead of message passing. You're just going to go ahead and do a quick semaphore. A lot of it is <clears throat> in your particular application, is it worth the uh, disadvantages of doing something like message passing? Um, or can you do something a little lower level like semaphore? Uh, so, in other words, it's important to know of these different techniques, message pass passing. Uh, semaphores, uh, mutexes, what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages? <clears throat> you know, when would you want to use semaphores? When would you want to use message passes? When would you want to use a mock? Okay, um, so again, in message passing, our same producer consumer model, on your producer, uh, you're going to do your infinite loop of while true, and you just say, hey, produce the item. So that's going to give you the item. Then you're going to send, uh, I mean, uh, receive the message, hey, consumer needs one. You go ahead and build the message, and then you send it. Okay. And in the same way, your consumer is going to go ahead and receive from the producer a message. That message is going to have the item. So once you get that message, and you're going to wait until it's there, um, you'll go ahead and extract that item. You have the item. Once you're done, You've uh, done everything you need to with it. You go ahead and send the producer back. Okay, I consumed it. That piece of the buffer is now empty. And then you can go ahead and consume that item. So it's the same thing we've seen multiple times. It's just a matter of <clears throat> am I implementing it with a message? Am I implementing it with a monitor? Am I Im implementing it with a semaphore? All are valid. This they have advantages and disadvantages. Okay. <clears throat> Well, that's fine when you're just talking about one thing. You know, some floors are great. Hey, I want it, I'm going to critical region, or I don't. Um, 
the producer consumer was, we don't have one item, we have several items, okay? And so it's gonna be full or empty or partially through. <laughs> what if we actually want to synchronize several things, okay? So we've got four different processes, A, B, C, and D, and um, they each need to complete before we go on. An example of this is we're gonna do a matrix multiply. So I'm gonna take my vector over here, I'm gonna multiply it times the matrix, right? So you multiply everything in this um, row, I mean, uh, everything in the uh, incoming column times the first column, sum it up, everything times the second column, sum it up, everything times the third column, sum it up, et cetera, and then you end up with this, um, this row vector, basically. Uh, so it'd be really easy to go ahead and say, here's my input, here's my matrix, processor one does the first column, processor two does the second column. But we can't write out that final um, row until everybody's completed. All in processes have to complete before we can write it out. <clears throat> so that's when they go ahead and do this barrier. So even though D completes, or B completes first, and then C, uh, D completes, and then A completes, we can't let everybody go on until C completes. So we have to go ahead and wait until the last process arrives at the barrier before we let them all through. Everybody has to finish their multiplies before they go on to the, to the next matrix <coughs> or the next iteration. <coughs> all right, <coughs> so now we've got multiple processes. Uh, sometimes they're producers and consumers, sometimes they're critical regions, sometimes they're block things. Um, when you do have multiple things trying to access the same resource, it is possible to get into a situation of deadlock. All right, so basically deadlock is when you have shared resources, whether it's memory or information or hardware devices or whatever, and each one of those processes can go ahead and put a block on, or be blocked for the need for that resource. Um, if you've got multiple things, and process one is waiting on this process, and holding on to process, you know, to resource two, and then process two is holding on to resource that process one needs, and waiting on the process two, then they're both always gonna be waiting, okay? And so there's an example right here where there's an intersection, and this actually should be a D here. So in order for this car to get through, C has to be open and D has to be open. Okay, that lane has to be open, both parts of that lane, in order for process three to get across. And, and four has to have D and A open. And two has to have B and C open, right? Well, <clears throat> let's say process three, C is open. So it, it holds on to that C process, and it's trying to get to the D process, but it's already being held by somebody else. So it's gonna grab C and wait for D. Well, four might grab D and be waiting for A, and one might grab A and be waiting for B, and so what we end up is a process like this. So three got halfway through the intersection, and it's waiting for the rest of the intersection to clear before it can go forward. But since all of them are currently waiting on a resource that is blocked, they're never gonna be able to get through that intersection. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, this is the same kind of thing. You know, you've got two resources, you know, maybe some memory and a printer, and this processor has the memory and it's waiting for the printer. This process has the printer and it's waiting for the memory. They'll never be able to complete because they're both blocked by the other one. <clears throat> so it's possible to have permanent blocking because multiple processes are competing for shared resources. Um, and there are several solutions to the problem, but there's no perfect solution. Okay? There's no silver bullet. So let's look at some of the solutions that are out there. All right, well one thing it's important to know is, are those resources preemptible? Okay? Meaning, can you take a resource away from a process? If you can, 
that makes the problem a lot easier. So in this example back up here, um, if car four can back up out of the intersection, then three can go forward, then two can go forward, then one can go forward, and then four can retake that, you know, that first part and second part, and then it can go forward. It's only if you have non-preemptible resources that you really have a problem. So, um, so a preemptible resource is a resource that can be taken away from a process without affecting it. A non-preemptible resource cannot be taken away without uh, adversely affecting it. One example is, again, we were talking about printer and memory, okay? So I've got one process that uh, grabbed the memory and wants the printer. We have another process that has the printer and wants the memory. Now, if process B has the printer, it's already spooled some of the stuff into the printer spool. You know, it's printed five of the 10 pages into the printer spool. Um, you can't easily back that back out, right? Because if anybody else jumps in here and starts printing into this printer spool, you'll get five pages of the document, somebody else's document, and then five more pages of the document, and that's not good. So that's sort of a non-preemptible resource. But memory, is memory preemptible? If you have a process and it has stuff in memory, can you take that memory away and then give it back later? Can you take all those values and dump them out to the disk Okay, we're in a virtual machine, right? And we have the idea of context switches. So could you say, hey, this guy has memory and is waiting on printer, this guy has printer and waiting on memory. Let's preempt this guy. Let's say, hey, we're gonna context switch you, put you in a busy wait, okay? We're gonna take all your memory and put it out to a context swap onto the disk. Now, this guy can go ahead, he's already got the printer, we're gonna give him the memory he needs, let him finish, then we're gonna pull this guy back in, we'll give him the memory he had and the now free printer. Does that make sense? Okay. If you have a preemptible resource, then you just go ahead and preempt it, free up the deadlock, and let it go. All right. And again, typically you would request a resource, use a resource, and release a resource. If you're in a preemptible resource, then you may end up having that resource taken away from you so that somebody else can complete, and then it'll give it back. Um, again, we've got uh, a case here, in case A, where you just go ahead and say, hey, I've got one, one resource, I up it, or I do it down, so the SIM4 goes to zero, anybody else who tries it down, it's gonna get a zero, they're gonna wait, put themselves in the queue, I'm gonna give, use that resource, because it's now allocated to me, one of the critical region, then I can up it, I can go ahead and release that resource back to everybody else. Cool. If you have multiple resources, you can do something similar. So you can go ahead and do a down on resource one, down on resource two, use both of them, and then do it up on resource two, up on resource one, everything's cool. The problem is if you do it wrong, okay? So here we've got a situation where we down one, down two, use them, down up one, or up two, up one. Not bad. We can go ahead and B is doing the same thing. He's going to down one and two and then use it and then up uh, two and one. The problem is if you implement it wrong. So here we go ahead and down one, down two, but B downs two and then downs one. So what happens if these two are both going, this one can go ahead and down one is about to do a down two and get swapped out. This one, downs two, is about to do a down one and get swapped out. This one goes and says, oh, I'm gonna grab two, can't, because this one downed it. This one goes and says, oh, I'm gonna down one, it can't, because the first one, process A, got it. These two are now in deadlock. These two implementations can't get in deadlock because if this one downs one, this one's gonna to try to down one, it's already taken. It never gets a chance to down two. So by doing one, two, two, one in both cases, these guys are safe. If you do one, two, two, one, you're setting yourself up for a deadline. 
Does that make sense? So you do have to be careful when you implement um, semaphores to make sure that you get them all in the right order. All right, the other day, we also, in addition to Byzantine generals, we were introduced to, did y'all do Dunning Philosopher's Problem? Did somebody do that one? I was hoping y'all, somebody, I, I had intended to ask somebody to present the Dunning Philosophers and the Bankers out of the room. I guess I forgot. All right, short version, Dunning's Philosophers. Um, you've got five philosophers. They're going to go eat. And they sit down at the table. Their philosopher of Sam has the tendency to think about something, and then, oh, okay, got that. And then look down, and I'm going to eat for a bit. And then they go think a bit. And then they want to eat a bit. And then they think a bit, and then they eat a bit. Well, the problem is, in order to eat the spaghetti, um, you need two forks. Usually it's chopsticks, but whatever. Um, so you have to grab the left fork and grab the right fork in order to eat. Which, as long as only one or two philosophers are trying to eat at the same time, you're okay. But the problem is, if this philosopher uh, over here grabs his left fork at the exact same time that this philosopher grabs the left fork, when this one goes to grab the right one, it's not available, right? So he can't eat because he doesn't have two forks, but he does have one in his left hand. Well, this guy and that guy and that guy and that guy could all have grabbed the left fork at the exact same time, and they're waiting to get the right fork for the other philosopher to eat, finish eating, and start thinking again. Well, if all of them grab the left fork at the same time, none of them are going to give up the left fork until they get the right fork. So we're in a deadlock uh, situation. Does that make sense? We're going to come back to this in a minute. But keep that in the back of your mind. All right, so what causes us to get in deadlock situations like this? Well, first off, um, you have to have mutual exclusion. You have to have areas where you're blocking something, right? So each resource um, can be assigned to exactly one process. So you know, uh, you can't have two people grabbing the same fork at the same time. All right, you gotta have a hold and wait condition, okay? So I'm gonna grab that left fork, and I'm gonna wait until I get the right fork to eat, and then I'll put them down. Okay? I'm not going to say, oh, I have my left fork, but I can't get the right one. I'm going to put it back down for a bit. You know, be polite to the guy next to you. No, we're, we're doing greedy. I'm going to keep this one until I get that one. With that greedy mindset, you can end up getting in a good one. Resources cannot be taken away. <clears throat> if I was in a situation where I grabbed the left one, I can't grab the right one, and the guy next to me says, I really, really need that white right fork. I'm going to take it away from you. Well then, he now has two forks, he eventually put it down, and the guy next to him is okay. If you cannot preempt resources, then again, you can potentially get into deadlock and circular wait. At least two processes are waiting on each other to release the resources in order to uh, complete what they need to do. So you have to have basically all four of those conditions in order to get in deadlock. Mutually exclusive, you have a hold and wait, you can't preempt, and you've got this circular loop. So if one of those is missing, then you're not going to get in the deadlock condition. Therefore, if you want to prevent this, what do you do? Fix one of those conditions. If you can prevent any one of those conditions, then you prevent the whole problem. All right. <clears throat> so how do you know if you're in a deadlock? Okay. Well, I've grabbed my left fork. I don't have a right fork. But maybe I'll get it in a minute. Or maybe I'll never get it. How do you know? Well, one way is to go ahead and make a graph. So if I go ahead and say that, um, that uh, T is the process. Okay. So I'm sorry. Uh, uh, T, any square is a resource. And any circle is a process. All right. So... If you have a arrow going into from a resource into a process, that means it's currently holding that uh, resource. So D, the process D, is holding resource T. If you have one going out of the process, it means it's requesting. So D is requesting resource U and has resource T. 
Well, C has U and is requesting T. Does that make sense? So we have obviously a deadlock, right? Because they each have one and they're waiting on the other. So if you model all the processes, the things that they have and the things that they're requesting, and you can end up with some funky model like this, right? If you just have the stuff on the left, you know, the A and the S and the F and all that, then you can eventually work your way through. It's only a case where you have a loop like that in the uh, graph that you're going to potentially get into the deadline. So one of the things is, if we go ahead and say, we're going to use this modeling, this uh, graph, as a model of the processes and the resources, then we're going to say, is it an acyclic graph or is it a cyclic graph? If there's a cycle in the graph, then we have a potential problem. If there's not a loop, there's not a cycle in the graph, we're OK. All right, um, so again, we're going to go ahead and say that process A is going to request our resource R, and it's going to request resource S. Okay. Um, so A wants R. And eventually, it's going to want S. So we would end up drawing an arrow um, from <coughs> S into A. Well, then um, B is going to request S, and C requests T. So we have our R is requested by A, S is requested by B, um, T is requested by C. So far, everything's good. We don't have any loops, right? Now, 4 all of a sudden requests S. Well, now we've got another line over here, and well, that's okay. We don't completely have a loop yet, but B requests T, so now we have a line here. So A requests S, T requests B. We're still okay, but it's that last one where we go ahead and have C request R. Now we have a loop, okay? And therefore, we're done now. So, how do you deal with it? Well, you can ignore the problem and say, well, 90% of the time, <laughs> we never have deadlock. It's only 10% of the time you have to reboot your machine. Well, that's not a really good uh, solution, right? So you can say, OK, well, we're going to let the, the machine go. We're going to have whatever scheduling algorithm we have, and it just does its thing. And occasionally, we'll check and say, are we in a deadlock situation? So we're going to detect the problem. And if we are, then we're going to fix it. And we'll figure out how to fix it in a minute. Or you can go ahead and say, oh, let's just reallocate the resources. OK, we're going to take this one away from that one. If you have a preemptive situation. Or even better, what if we just prevented it initially? OK, what if we prevented any one of those conditions then we know we're never going to get into that deadline. Does that make sense? Okay. So we can ignore it. We can deal with it once we detect it. We can try to see that it's about to happen and prevent it, or just block one of those four conditions. All right, so detection and recovery. <clears throat> um, so we're going to go ahead and let deadlocks occur. And then we're going to test to see, hey, is one currently going on? And after it occurs, we find out where it's happening, and then we do something about it. What can we do? Well, we can force some of the resources um, away from a process, if they are preemptible resources. Or we can just kill the process and say, nope, you're out of here. Okay. So if in the example right over here, um, if we just go ahead and kill um, any one of the processes in here, then the loop goes away, right? So, um, and then what you do is you just go ahead and respawn that process later on, right? You put it back into the ready waiting queue. Or, um, so yeah, we can preempt a resource or we can kill a process. So here's the example here. Um, so we can go ahead and, if we can go ahead and kill one of these guys over here on this side, 
then we're all good. So how do we do that? Basically, the algorithm is for every node in the graph, um, and it doesn't really start matter where you start. Uh, you've got a list L, and you just go ahead and look at all the arcs coming into it. You add it to L. Okay. Um, then uh, you check to see is there anything in L two times. If it is, yeah, you got a loop. You're out of it. If not, then you take everything in that list. And you go ahead and mark it as, as closed. And you look at all the things that are going out of each of those nodes. And you just basically repeat it. Okay? It's just a recursive algorithm. So eventually, you'll either hit the end of, the, um, of that graph, of that uh, path, and uh, you can say, OK, we're good here. Or you'll find a cycle. Or you'll run out of empty nodes, unmarked nodes. So in this case here, we go ahead and you know, we say, hey, we've got R. Uh, I mean, uh, we've got A looking on R, you throw it in. You down here, look at all the C, D, F. They're all looking at S. We have A, C, D, F, we're good. Um, if we stopped at that point, we're done. But then we end up going over here. Well, B wants T, okay, no big deal. Um, we've got E here, and it's no big deal. We've got G here. Eventually we add D. D is now in there twice. We have a deadline. So it's just traversal of the graph. Yep. Every, has everyone done graphs before? First year two. So traversing graphs is no big deal. So easy uh, algorithm for detecting um, basically deadlocks. You just go in there and see is, is there a loop. Okay. Well, that's fine if you're looking at a single resource. Uh, you know, I've got a printer. I've got a memory. Um, and it's like, okay, I need a printer, I need memory, boom, you've got uh, a conflict. What if you have multiple resources? Like, I've got four printers. So process A needs a printer and memory. Well, I've got four printers. Well, process B needs two printers. And process C needs three printers. Well, I've got four printers total. If process A goes in there, he can get all three he needs, we're okay. And if process A wants his one printer, we're okay, we still have four. But if process two gets kicked in, all of a sudden now, it wants two printers, we don't have enough resources, right? So how do you deal with that? It's a lot harder to, deter, to detect deadlock when you have multiple similar resources. Um, so there's a matrix-based approach. You're not gonna use the graph to figure it out, you're gonna have to have, actually have to have a full matrix. So, um, you basically say, well, how many resources exist of each type? Um, how many requests do each process, um, how many resources do each process need in their request? And then um, you can go ahead and then compare those available and requests to see if there's a problem. Here's an example. <clears throat> So we're going to have a vector of E, uh, and those are the resources that exist. So if I have one printer and three um, chunks of memory and four um, whatever, uh, tape drive or something like that. So E is going to be what exists. Okay. A is what's currently allocated. So of the three printers that I have, I've currently got two of them in use. Okay. So You've got your current allocation mix and then your request mix. So if process one says, well, I need one printer and one chunk of memory and I don't need any other resources. So you have one and one up there in the request mix. If process in says, I don't need a printer, so I'm going to have a zero here, um, I need three chunks of memory and I need the, uh, the hard drive. So you have a zero, three, and one. Then what you can start doing is you can look at what you currently have available and what everybody's asking for to see if you're potentially going to get the deadline. All right. Um, so there's actually something called the Baker's algorithm. It's written by Edgar Dijkstra. And it basically says, hey, I'm going to look at all the unmarked processes. So I'm basically I'm just going to go through each one of those uh, requests. And it's going to look for 
any row that is requiring less of the resources that are currently available. So if I've got um, two printers and six chunks of memory available, and I've got a request for one printer and one chunk of memory, it can currently be serviced by what's available. I'm going to mark it as valid, right? Um, and if so, then you're going to say, well, we can actually let it run. And when it's done, it can release, release all of its resources back into the available, right? So if we happen to have, and again, pop back for a second. Um, you can say resource in currently has one chunk of memory. And it's requesting one and three more. Well, what it's done is to let the one and the three and the one it already had go. So it's going to end up adding back up there a one, a three plus the one, a four, and then zeros. So our A1 is going to go up by one. Our A2 is going to go up by four. All right? So it's just a how many do you have plus how many do you need. We're going to add those together. So that's your maximum possible need, right? When you're done, those all get added back. Those get freed up, right? And so we're going to add those back to our A. So basically what you do is you come up here and you say, OK, I'm going to look for a process. Is there anything out there whose requests are small enough that it can be currently um, satisfied by what's available? If so, assume we're going to run that process, and it frees everything up back into the list. And then you go to the next process in the list. Does this have enough that's free? Let's say the next process doesn't. It needs four of the thing at the end, and there's not four of the thing at the end. So we're going to say, this one cannot currently be satisfied. So we're going to go to the next process. Can this one be satisfied? Yes, it can be satisfied. Great. Assume it's going to complete, and it adds its resources back. And you go all the way through the list, and maybe half of the resources, or I'm sorry, half of the processes can be satisfied. So they're going to release all of their resources back. There were a couple that couldn't be satisfied at the current state. Well, then you go back to those and you say, now that everybody else has released their resources, can this one now be satisfied? Oh, yeah. So it releases it. Now, can this one be satisfied? Yes. Eventually, it will release its resources. And if you get all the way down to the end and find out, well, yeah, everybody could be satisfied if you do things in the right order. Great, we're not in the deadlock situation. But if you get to a point where you've got a process that no matter who finishes and releases all of their resources, they will never have enough resources, now you're in a deadlock situation. Okay? So um, look for any unlocked process. See what it has. If it's less than A, great. Assume it's going to finish and add to it. If so, mark it and you're good. Eventually, you go all the way through. Um, hopefully, or obviously, everything starts off initialized and unmarked. Hopefully, you can mark everything as yes, they can finish. If you ever get all the way through and you have an unmarked process, then you're potentially in a deadlock state. So here's an example. Uh, let's say we have four tape drives, three, or two plotters, three scanners, and one CD uh, ROM. All right? Currently, process one has one scanner allocated to it. It's got two tape drives and one CD-ROM allocated, and then one plotter and two scanners. Does that make sense? Do you see what we're doing with the, the matrix? Where we got the zeros and ones, and twos and threes? All right. So now we have a request over here that says, hey, process one wants two more tape drives and one CD ROM. Okay? Well, currently we have two tape drives available, so we could fulfill this request right here, but how many CD ROMs do we currently have available? We have zero, right? Because mm -hmm. A, the currently available, currently has zero. So we cannot currently fulfill processes one's requests. So we're not going to mark it. We're going to go to process two. So process two needs one tape drive and one scanner. 
Do we have one tape drive available? Yeah, we got two of them available. But do we have one scanner? Nope, uh-oh, things are looking bad. We cannot do process two right now. So let's go to process three. Process three needs two tape drives and one plotter. Can we do that? Well, we have two tape drives available, so we can do that. We have one plotter available, we can do that. So we can actually fulfill process three's needs. So we're gonna mark that as, yes, this one can work. The, the, the bottom process can work. So we're gonna assume everybody else was blocked. He got access to all its critical regions. He got the resources he needed to take in the plotter. He finished. As soon as he finishes, he's gonna release um, what he has. So he's got the two that he had here, one here. Plus, he already had one scanner, um, sorry, one plotter and two scanners. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna bump the plotters up by one because he's releasing one. So it's this one right here is getting released and that one's getting released. So now we're gonna have a two, 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 zero, right? Everybody see that? So when this got released, we went to two, 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 zero. So now we go back up here and say with a uh, two, 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 zero, can we fulfill this request? If we have a two 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 zero, can we uh, fulfill a two zero zero one? No. no. But with a two 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 zero, can we fulfill a one zero one zero? Yeah, because we have two here, we only need one. We have two, we need zero. We have two, we only need one. So we can actually fulfill this request. So with a two 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 zero, we fulfill this, and then all of this gets returned. So now we have a four, two, two, one. And with a four, two, two, one, can we do a two, zero, zero, one? With a four, two, two, one? We can't, because we have four uh, tape drives, we only need two. And we have a four, two, two, one, we have one CD-ROM, that's all we need. So as it turns out, even though it looked really bad in the beginning, eventually, if you do process three, and then do process two, and then do process one, we're actually okay. Uh, I thought there was another example of that, but anyways, you can see if this was actually a two, then it wouldn't have worked, everything would have been deadlocked, we would have been in a bad state. <sighs> All right, so again, recovery. Um, one thing is go ahead and take away something, that assumes you have preemptible resources, uh, so it's gonna depend on the resource. Another way to do it is through rollbacks. So let's say, has everybody taken a database course? Y'all know, does anybody not know what a rollback is? Okay, basically a rollback is a, okay, have you ever played a video game and there's a you know, little check thing, if you get to this point, it checks it, it saves your state. So if you know a minute later you die, you can go, go back to that previous state Everything you had at this state was still good? Okay, that's what a rollback is. So basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna go ahead and say, every so often, I'm gonna save the current state of a process. And if I ever get into a, a, a deadlock position, then I'm not gonna completely kill the process. I'm gonna go ahead and put it in a busy wait state and send it back to its previous uh, checkpoint. And when I do that, then everybody else finishes, and now it can go back in. So it's, it will have released all the resources that it had held, put it back when we put it back in that uh, rollback state. So, um, so in any case, if deadlock occurs, you basically reset it to an earlier state. Uh, and again, you could just kill the process, but that's pretty, pretty heavy-handed, <laughs> pretty crude, pretty easy to implement, but um, not very nice. But it also has very little overhead. You don't have to have the storage of all those chip points. Again, multiple ways of um, fixing deadline. Yes? In the rollback, does it like save all the chip points or does it just save one per process? Um, well, you, you just like delete the previous ones. 
Well, that's the thing is um, you can often, especially in databases, you'll have a begin transaction, end transaction. When you commit that transaction, it goes ahead and you know, actually puts it in the database and you're done. Um, you can have checkpoints and you can roll back to a checkpoint, but until you actually do that commit, it's going to save all those checkpoints so that you can roll back and roll back and roll back if you need to. But once you finally to a good state, then you'll say commit, all those checkpoints go away because the okay. database is now in its good state. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is, we're allowing deadlocks to happen. We're noticing that, ah, there's a deadlock. Now I'm gonna go ahead and fix it by doing rollbacks or checkpoints or killing the process or whatever. Instead, we can go ahead and try deadlock avoidance, okay? So basically, when the re as soon as the resources are requested, then the system has to decide should I grant that request, yes or no? Um, and one of the ways to do that is to have a uh, resource trajectory. You're gonna predict what resources it may need, map them all out, and if you can determine <coughs> if there's a possible deadlock, then don't allow that resource request. So again, you know, if you've got two resources, they're both trying to get printers and plotters, uh, you can say, oh, well, if this resource went from state P to Q, it needed a printer, and then it's going to go up to here to R, where it needs a plotter, and then it goes to S, where it needs another printer, and then T, where it needs another plotter. That whole path is all fine. But if it ever gets up to this point here, where process B and process A are both gotten into a place where they need more resources than are currently available, then we're in a bad state. So if it's possible that our path ever goes here, then we need to go ahead and say that this is an unsafe uh, uh, set of processes, and we need to just block um, either A or B until the other one's done. Okay, um, again, what is a way to do that? Basically, you're just saying, hey, uh, you look at the state of all the processes, um, you're going to decide, is, uh, is it safe? If so, we let everybody do their thing. If, we're, if potentially we can get in an unsafe state, then we won't allow these things, these uh, requests to go through. Uh, so, what's the way of doing that? So again, uh, it's very similar to the matrix thing we looked at earlier. So if process A currently has three uh, units of resource, let's say memory. We know the max it's ever going to need is nine, and B needs two, and the max it's ever going to need is four, and um, C currently has two and needs seven, and we currently have three free, then are we in a good state? Well, you can see here, if we uh, go ahead and give the B, what it wants, so it wants two more, right? So of the three, the three free that we currently have, if we give two of them to B, B has the four it needs, okay? We only have one available, but when B finishes, it's gonna release all four bits back down, so now we have five available. So then, now we have still three needs nine, and C, had two, needs seven, so it needs four. I'm um, sorry, it needs five. Well, there's five available, so we give all five of those to C. It now has seven to seven, it eventually finishes. We free seven up, then A needs three. I'm sorry, uh, three to six, it needs six. There's seven available, everything's good. So this was actually a valid safe state. Here's an example where we're not in a safe state. So here, um, we needed, had three needed nine, had two needed four, had two needed seven. We got three free. So if we go ahead and give them, um, let's say one to uh, A. So it has four, it still needs nine. Then we go ahead and say, okay, we have the two available. Let's give those two to B. 
So it's going to go ahead and take uh, four here. It needs four. It's going to eventually finish. It's going to give those four back. Well, now C, how many does C need? Five. It needs five. How many does A need? Five. five. How many are free? Four. So by doing that allocation, I mean, and this is the exact same as the other way. I mean, we have three, nine, two, four, two, seven, three, free. Same thing, three, nine, two, four, two, seven. So it's the exact same processes, the exact same means, but by allocating one of them to A first, we just put ourselves in an unsafe state, okay? So basically what you have to do is you use what's called the banker's algorithm. <clears throat> and it's the idea of saying, hey, if we do them in this order, are we in a guaranteed safe state? Okay. And you basically just run through that and say, hey, you know, if we do process C and then A, or C and then B and then A, we know we're good, then that's the way we're gonna order it. Yes. On that last slide, yep. if you so if you instead of just allocating two of your three free resources to B, yep. and then let it finish, yep. it would have released yep. four. It would have worked just fine. And yeah, and then you would have had seven free and you could do the rest with that. Right. Okay. So it's a matter of if I if I allocate this amount to this process, will that put me in a safe or unsafe state? Mm -hmm. Okay. So as you're doing the scheduling algorithm, you can use the banker's algorithm to say, is this safe or not? If it's not safe, then don't allocate that resource. Try a different way. Let's instead of allocating one to A, let's allocate two to B. If we do that, we're cool. If we allocate one to A, we're uncool. Okay, we're not gonna be in a safe state. And so the idea is to go ahead and determine if I'm gonna do these resources in this order, is that gonna put me in a safe or unsafe state? So as each request comes in, you see if it leads to a safe or unsafe state. If it leads to an unsafe state, don't grant the request, okay? Um, and so go on. And again, you can do the same algorithm if you have multiple resources, okay? So I could have, hey, I've got um, three tape drives and zero plotters and printers, and you go ahead, <coughs> you just look for any um, uh, process whose resources can be uh, allocated given the current resources. Uh, assume they finish, add them back, go through the whole cycle. If everything works, great. If it doesn't work, you're in an unsafe state. Don't allocate those resources. Problem. This is a lot of extra resource checking, right? Okay, you gotta create the paths, you gotta look at all the possible paths, you gotta have this whole um, matrix and you're gonna to have to run that scheduling algorithm every time a resource is requested. Uh, and it is possible that some processes may be uh, unfairly affected because, you know, earlier, if we gave A a single resource, that was gonna potentially put us in an unsafe state. So we ended up giving it to C or B. Um, a never got all the resources it needed until everything else was done, right? So even though A may have been a really short program and B and C took hours to run, we're not gonna let A run because it might put us in an unsafe state. So you might say, well, you know, that's unfair. Uh, you know, this is my CS1302 project and it's only gonna take five minutes to run, but you're saying I have to wait two and a half hours for all the, you know, 3341 students to get done before I get my stuff done? In any case, so, yes? Would you process, uh, would you sort these processes in like batches? So like you had 20 short processes mm -hmm. and one really long one, mm -hmm. you would probably do the 20 short ones first and then the long one, but if you had like a constant stream of processes, mm -hmm. the long one might just... Yeah, it's already, yeah. You're about six slides ahead of us. Hold that thought. Okay. All right. So yeah, problem didn't like avoidance is requires extra overhead. Some processes may be unfairly affected. And the other thing is, do you know when you're running your program how many blocks of memory you're going to need? No. This assumes that you always know how much 
of every resource you'll need. So it may not always be valid if you have variable resource needs. All right, <clears throat> so now we're back to the um, 90 plus search problem. So let's go ahead and use semaphores to try and figure it out. So we've got philosopher I, okay, um, philosopher one, philosopher two, three, four, five. So we're going to actually have five processes, five copies of the philosopher process running. Um, and basically, we've got this infinite loop, and they switch before I switch between. I think I go ahead and grab the left fork, I grab the right fork, I eat. When I'm done, then I put back the right fork, back the left fork, and we proceed on. So obviously it's possible if you go ahead and begin um, multiple processes, you know, you fork it and you're running them all. So you're running philosopher zero, philosopher one, two, three, and four. You've got five of these processes running at the same time. Obviously it's possible for one of them to pick up fork left, or I'll say fork I minus one and I plus one. Oh, I'm sorry, I and I plus one. Um, it's possible for them all to grab the left fork, the i fork, and then the i plus one fork mod five as it circles around. It's not going to be available. <clears throat> so this is a solution, but you're pretty likely to have deadlock. All right. Everybody got this one? Understand? Yes. Okay. So the program thinks, and then it waits for the, the two ports yep. to be released. Yep. And then and then the, and then you signal that those are open again, right? Right. So you put your forks down and they're, yeah. they're now free. And the problem is they can all be interrupted after they take the first port. Right? Right. Exactly. Okay. So you know fork, uh, process one might get fork to the left, mm -hmm. about to go fork to the right, it gets swapped out. Mm -hmm. Now the next process grabs the fork to the left, is about to have the fork to the right. And if all five of those happen at the same time, mm -hmm. then you're in a deadlock. Okay. Okay. So, um, one way, the naive solution, is to say, if you can't get both forks, then release both forks and just wait. Okay. What's the problem with that one? Uh, everybody's picking up a fork and everybody's dropping a fork. Mm -hmm. Almost there. That, that, that's almost the problem. I mean, the fact that you dropped them and then you picked them back up, you're wasting cycles, absolutely. But the problem is, let's say everybody drops their forks and eventually one of them grabs them and grabs them and it eats. Great. So philosopher A finally got a chance to eat. He put his down. And, and philosopher B eventually grabs its forks and picks them up and, and, and eats. And philosopher C went to grab the forks, grabbed one of them, couldn't grab the other one, so he put it down. Well, then D grabbed the forks and it ate, and A ate, and B ate. Is it possible that C never gets to eat? Because we're randomly putting them down and picking them up. Okay? So, nobody's, we're not, everybody's not deadlocked. Okay? But it's possible that most of the processes eventually get to eat. But, probabilistically, one process could never get to eat, right? That's a special case of deadlock called live lock. Most of the processes get to go. Okay, so no, it's not like nobody's running, but one person is starting resources, not everybody is starting resources. One person is at the start. So this is not the best solution. Um, so there's a second solution. Um, again, this one was done by Edgar Bagstra. Uh, and basically what he did is he added an extra weight. Um, so there's a variable called room, and he basically says, okay, once, and, and if you want to think about it, you've got your five philosophers, okay? Let's say they're all out in the waiting area. Now, if you only let one philosopher into the room at a time, you're guaranteed he can grab both forks, right? So. You wait out the waiting area. You're allowed to go in, so you go in. You can grab both forks, do whichever you want to do. You put the forks down. You go back out to the waiting area. Now, 
the next guy can go in. Is that going to work? Yeah. Right, because you only have one process ever in the room. You only have one philosopher in the room. Yeah, you lost all your ability to do concurrency, right? In the other examples, you may actually have two or three philosophers eating at once. In this example, you basically serialized everything. So this one, you never have to worry about deadlock, you never have to worry about starvation, but you don't get concurrence. But wait, there's another solution. All right, uh, it's called the hierarchical solution. And again, it's proposed by Dijkstra. And he basically gave a partial ordering to the forks. And so you basically got preference to the lower numbered philosopher. Okay, so if there was ever a conflict, the lowest philosopher wins. So again, um, you go ahead and uh, you can prevent deadlock. Uh, you're not as likely to have live lock. Live lock. Um, but it is possible that the highest level uh, philosopher can stop. We're going to go ahead and stop here because I think time. We got a few more. We got a few more. I will tell you, I'm going to send out a YouTube link, and it goes over all three of these. We cover them pretty quick. Um, there's the Dijkstra solution. There's a uh, another solution. I'm trying to remember, uh, Chandra Mishra, um, and the Arbiter. All three of these solutions. Um, are detailed in this YouTube with pictures, so it makes it a lot easier to understand than we just sitting up here and spouting off things. So if you will definitely look over that. In fact, I think we will stop here. <coughs> we'll have y'all look over those, and then we'll start back up next time with the three solutions: the hierarchical solution, the uh, <coughs> the monitor or waiter solution, uh, or arbiter solution, and then the Chandra Misra. But the reason I wanted to stop here is because we have homework to do. We should talk about homework. So let's pop up. And if you want to go ahead and look at your E2L.